If you will, turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. We have been in a series looking at the characters of Christmas, and uh, we have fared very well, I think, so far. And so we are excited to conclude this particular portion of our series. And while you're turning there, I want to talk about babies. Can I talk about babies for a moment? You know, um, you know, you have these different announcements, you know, that comes. Now, when my wife and I had the first two kids, I don't think, we didn't have Facebook at the time. I don't think so. And, and we didn't place anything on, you know, gender reveal and all of that. You know, I, I, I think with Timothy, I think we did either Timothy or Joel, we did like the, my wife actually, not me. She did uh, scramble words, you know, the scrabble, whatever, and, and put it on Facebook. We had Facebook at that time. But that was about it. But the announcement of a baby, we have all these different announcements. We have, you know, those with the gender reveals. You have, you know, someone hitting the baseball, uh, not a baseball, but something with a baseball bat or a stick. Some, you know, are hilarious because sometimes they miss. Uh, so you see some popping a balloon or a cake or whatever it may be, but it's an announcement of a baby, uh, you know, a particular gender in that re in respects. But uh, sometimes people, they would, uh, in the announcement of a baby, they would come up, and, and this happened to someone. Uh, the, the daughter and the son-in-law went up to the house and had, like, these little uh, clothes to, you know, what you call them, onesies, and showed the, you know, the dad and the mom, and they just went crazy, you know, announcements. But babies change your life. Baby changes everything. Sleep. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Baby changes sleep. I, you know, I remember uh, it was just with Timothy. Timothy was, he's interesting. He just wanted to stay up at night and sleep in the morning and the day and all of that. And, and so a lot of times, you know, Chantel, she would, you know, by the fourth kid, it's like, you better get up, boy. You know, and so, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm sitting here rocking Timothy and I'm about half asleep. He about falling out my hands, you know. I mean, he's just, you know. But they keep you awake. They change things. Yeah, and, and one of the things we don't want Timothy to do, we don't want him to take a nap during the day because if he takes a nap during the day, he's going to be up all night. And so we're like, you know, we, <laughs> we're like, you got to stay up. You got to stay up. Come on. We're in the car doing all sorts of things, crazy things to get him to stay up. But we talk baby talk. And look at that baby. Look at that, you know. <laughs> Changes us. Sometimes we can't wait to get home to hold them. It's our precious baby. Sometimes we can't wait to get away and let the other parents stay there. And, uh, you know, that's your, you know. Our, our schedules, my wife and our schedules will never be the same because of our boys. I remember uh, Caleb was playing football uh, this year and, and, you know, previous years and, and Israel and, and having to, Figure out which game you're going to go to or where you're going to take them and, and so forth. Our schedules will never be the same. Baby changes everything. But this announcement, this announcement is not your typical announcement in the book of Luke. This baby will change history, has changed history. If you're physically able to do so, please stand with me as we read God's holy word. We're looking at Luke chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. Verse 10 says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Everybody say, all the people. Amen. Verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13 says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened with which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They didn't lag around. They didn't try to find a Starbucks or anything. They just went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them uh, concerning this child. They made known. In all, in verse 18 says, in all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask at this time, at this hour, that you would speak to us. Lord, we are celebrating the birth of Christ, the Messiah, the one who is king. And Father, help us to see his glory, see your glory, Father. We pray, Lord God, that you would challenge us in this passage, Lord, that you would encourage us and grow us, let us not leave here the way we came. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. As always, use me as a vessel. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So the characters of Christmas, we've been in this series. The first character we saw was Zechariah. Zechariah uh, didn't have a kid. He didn't have, he and Elizabeth and, and the angel, while he was in the temple performing the duties and so forth, told him, say, look, you're about to have a baby. And so, uh, uh, and it was so. Mary, an angel came to Mary. An angel came to Mary and said, you're getting ready to have the Messiah, the Messiah. And then Joseph, an angel came to Joseph in a dream, and, and he said, look, Mary, 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 don't divorce her, because the baby that she has is from the Holy Spirit. Now we arrive here in, in this passage, uh, in verses, you know, one through seven, Joseph took his family uh, back to Bethlehem to be counted in a, in a census. Now there Jesus was born, just as the prophet Micah had, had announced centuries before, in Micah 5.2. Now there they found no guest room available for the birth. Even the, the, the crude pu public shelters they might have called an inn were full, probably because of the census. Even if someone had said, listen to this, even if someone had said the Son of God is about to be born, they surely would not have listened. God would not come this way. He wouldn't come this way. He is, it's just too ordinary, if you will too unspectacular, too much like everybody else's birth. It's not, there's nothing special about this. Now we arrive here in verse 8. And it says, in, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping uh, watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, all the people. Verse 11 says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths and lying in a manger. Try to picture this scene for a moment. Just try to picture this scene. One evening in the hills of Bethlehem, flocks of sheep are, are settling down to, to sleep, uh, you know, for the night. Fires have been lit and shepherds are, are, are sleeping by the fires or with their bodies kind of stretched across the door of the pen to protect their sheep from, from the, any type of thieves or predators. 
Now, these shepherds, if you will, have spent their lives outside in the elements. So their skin is, is worn and, and, and cracked. Their appearance must most likely and, and, uh, and smell like they, like they need a bath or something, you know. And, 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 but this is the nature of their work. They are, they are shepherds. They're spending time with their sheep. And suddenly the night sky is filled with light and a multitude, a multitude of heavenly hosts, it said, appeared to, to them to give them good news. This angel comes and gives them good news of great joy. And listen to this. God uses outcasts. This is your first point. God uses outcasts to announce Jesus' birth. He uses, his, uh, uses outcasts. These shepherds were chosen to receive the greatest announcement of all. Allow me to kind of paint a, a deeper picture, if you will, of the shepherds. Shepherds were considered the lowest class in Jewish society. Uh, they stunk. They, they, they were looked down upon by the religious authorities. In fact, the religious authorities disliked them so much, they wouldn't allow them to participate in the religious ceremonies in Jerusalem. Furthermore, they were looked upon with contempt, not favorably, with the Egyptians in Genesis 46, 32 through 34. And it says, and the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have bought, brought their uh, flocks and their herds and all that they have. In verse 33 of Genesis 46, it says, when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. They also were considered unreliable, which meant that their testimony was not even received in court. Right, so someone of this magnitude should not be coming to some outcasts. They, they shouldn't be coming to some shepherds. No, no angel, a, a spiritual being shouldn't be coming to any, uh, to any uh, shepherds. If this is truly the king, he should be announced to other dignitaries and, and special folk, not shepherds. Jews who were living in the time of Christ's birth would, would have found it quite odd that God chose to tell the shepherds about the birth of the Messiah. All those scripture highlights, numerous examples of the noble image of the shepherd over time, Jews did not have a high opinion about shepherds. But listen to this, these shepherds received the greatest announcement in history. The greatest announcement in history. In fact, it was good news Good news. This good news is for all the people of the world, kings and shepherds alike. Listen, God, was, God is showing, God was showing that everyone in society can play a pivotal role in the helping to build his kingdom. Think about that for a moment. The first people to whom God announced the birth of the Messiah to were those who could not even enter the temple to worship Yahweh. Could you imagine not being allowed to come to church just because of your occupation? The Mishnah, uh, which is part of the Jewish oral tradition separate from the Bible and gives directions for living uh, in proper Jewish life, it includes some, kind of, some unkind passages about shepherds. It says shepherds are incompetent and that if a shepherd falls into a pit, no one should feel obligated to rescue him. Imagine being a shepherd in a society where the religious leaders taught that if you were trapped and needed help, people could ignore you and they wouldn't even get in trouble for it. Pretend that you're going somewhere. You're headed somewhere in your car, your bike, and, and, and let's say your tire blows out. And you're in this small town and, and everybody knows you and you are, you know, you, you're just there and, 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 you're, and, and your occupation, just because of your occupation, people just are not going to like you and not going to help you. And they just pass you by and, and nothing happens. I mean, everybody's like, okay, we're just going to keep going on. And you, but you need help. You need help. 
That was the social standard of the, of the uh, standing of the shepherds when the angels announced to them of the birth of the Messiah. But the fascinating thing about this is when Jesus grew up, he would tell a parable. He would tell a parable. Jesus said in Luke 10, 25 through 37, y'all still with me? He says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he said, um, he, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and, and when he saw him pass by on the other side, he just, just passed by him. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the uh, place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Then in verse 33, Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went in, uh, to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The Good Samaritan. This parable showed the people how wrong that thinking was and, and to show them that God cares about all people, not just some people, all people, all the people of the world, even the ones we sometimes go out of our way to avoid. He loves them. He loves them. Listen, God can use anybody. He can use anyone. As one author put it, I love it. He says, he doesn't want to change your surroundings so he can use you. God wants to use you in your current surroundings. We have to avoid the false dilemma that our surroundings determine our value and our use in God's work. An angel makes an announcement. He makes an announcement to some stinking behind shepherds. Shepherds of all people. God used outcasts to announce Jesus' birth. But not just any birth, a birth that shows, listen to this, the cosmic scope of God's salvific plan. Verse 13 through 20, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Verse 17 says, and when they saw it, they made known, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. In the first week, we saw an angel appeared to Zacharias to tell him that his prayers for a son has been heard. We saw an angel go to Mary and she was going to, he told her that she was going to give birth to God's son. And then and an angel told Joseph that it was okay for him to marry Mary. Finally, it was an angel with an heavenly host who appeared to the shepherds to announce that the Messiah had been born. 
angels, anglos, one who is sent, messenger, sending a message from God himself. Their presence throughout what we uh, call the Christmas story shows us how much God's salvation plans affect the poor, affect the powerful, affect the elderly, affect the young and the marginalized. He uses everyday moments like daily prayer in the temple to convey something big. When one looks at the Christmas story, it is firmly rooted in this world. Are y'all still with me? The presence of angels also tells us that the Christmas story is supernatural. This is a supernatural thing. It's a supernatural thing. Angels are the her heralds of God's heavenly kingdom breaking into this world. They appear everywhere directed by God's hand in the temple to a young girl. In the dreams of Joseph or the dreams of, a, of the wise men in, in the night sky and every time, listen, every single time the angel comes and he speaks, he talks, their message is the same. God is entering this world. He's coming. So what do the presence of these spiritual beings present? Listen, it calls our attention to the birth of a king the birth of a king. God entering our world in human form changed everything. Changed everything. This was a once in a lifetime thing. It ain't gonna happen again. It's only one time. No one will ever experience this again. And these shepherds were there. And these angels was telling him, telling them about the birth of the king. Each king seen so far in the biblical narrative had human folk welcoming them into the position of power, raising their national identity, if you will. They were praising and paying homage to the king, worshiping him in all his array. And, and they put on uh, all the glitter, the glamour, and the glitz into welcoming the king. But when the king came, y'all following me, when the king came, he didn't have an entourage of power and prestige welcoming him. He didn't come in chariots. He came in a town where there was no room for him. None. In, a, in the lowly of places. You know, while the, while the king of that known world, the, the Roman emperor at that day, uh, Caesar Augustus, was moving people around for his senses, the king of the universe was putting pieces into place for his quiet, uh, quiet entry. And when that moment came, as fitting as it was in the presence of the most glorious and most powerful king, the spiritual beings, the angels took over the sky, not any human entourage, but heavenly hosts filled the sky. This is not one, two, or three. This is an army. Hosts praised and worshipped the Messiah. He said, glory, glory, doxa, the state of being, magnificent, greatness, splendor, honor. It's all wrapped into one. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Then the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people experienced 400 years of silence. There were no prophetic word being spoken, but now. Can you imagine the weariness? Can you imagine the, the, the waiting for, for, for something to happen? When is the king coming? The unfolding of God's salvation plan was something heaven had been waiting to see. The apostle Peter said in his letter, I love it. He said uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, he said, It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. This word long in the, in the Greek is epithymeo. It, it, it conveys a powerful, strong desire. It, it is to set the heart upon something or, or someone. Listen, God's salvation plan, what we call the Christmas story, is not a story that is, is worn out. 
It's not a worn out story that, that many people uh, believe that, that, that they have to just sit through each and every single year. Listen, you get to sit through this every single year because of the Messiah, our God, our King being born for you, for me. Well, so what? So what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with us in this place? Looking at these characters and seeing this here, the birth of Jesus shows that everyone has an important role to play in the kingdom of God. Everyone. Doesn't matter how young, old, rich, poor, whatever occupation you have, everyone has an important role to play in the kingdom of God. We as believers, we have a responsibility as followers of Jesus. Listen, as followers of the King, we have a responsibility. That is to, to announce that God offers peace to sinful, hurting people. He offers hope. He offers life. Apart from having that kind of peace, we cannot possibly experience Christmas for all it intended to be. The announcement. Not just any announcement, the announcement of a king. One who, is a, who was born in, in this obscure place, this place that animals were around wasn't just any type of king. People look for a king. When they look for a king, they look for all this glitter and all this stuff that's going on and, 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 and being presented. And it's not being born where animals are at. But this king came low. He came for us. The announcement of a king. 